from the moment we got the assignment to delivery of the final show was uh, or series was just over three years. Sounds like a long time, but for us, it's like, you know, usually another year would be nice. We shot in 24 different uh, countries, uh, so locations at both poles and uh, all over the world. Every location, we had smallish crews. In Antarctica, for example, uh, on our boat, we had three boat crew, and then we had five film crew. But two of the film crew, one was a medic and one was a safety diver, so it really had nothing to do with production. And then we had an underwater DOP, a director, which was me, and a topside uh, camera. But we could all do everything. We could all also do drones. We could all dive. We could all do each other's jobs. We shot uh, using a lot during uh, using a GSS topside, uh, so gyro stabilized system. We had the Phantom and the Red and that shooting up to 800 frames a second. We uh, the Reds were our go-to, I think, for most of our underwater stuff. We shot about 350 hours. I know that the terabyte count was enough that the Hubble telescope would take 18 years to send it back to Earth. What makes shooting on the water and in the water so much more difficult than shooting in the Sahara or, you know, in the plains or anywhere else? Yeah, apart from everything, <laughs> it's a, it is so much harder. I mean, you've got sensitive electronics, high-tech equipment, and you've got seawater and, and salt water. So, so that's, that's just the beginning. But also when you go on a shoot, it's a boat, which is expensive. And the equipment, the underwater equipment, the divers, everything logistically is more complicated. Then you have factors of weather. You know, can you even get out on the waves? The weather has to be right. You need sunlight to penetrate the, the waves under underwater. It can, you can have all that and still have really bad visibility. So you need clear visibility. You need the whales to show up. And once they show up, you need to you know, be in there with them and you need them to do something. So the complexity is exponentially 10 times harder than something on land. Off the coast of Western Australia, what's likely the world's largest migration of humpback whales turns the water into a highway. What was the most difficult shot to execute? And one of the ones that I'm sort of most proud of was the humpbacks breaching off the coast of Western Australia. Because we wanted a shot where there was just ocean, you know, nothing but ocean, and then the, the whale comes up. And of course, then you have to work out when and where exactly on this vast ocean a whale is going to breach and, and come up into frame. So we had all the right equipment so that we could be steady, you know, rock steady on a shot, even though we were in a boat. But then beyond the, the technical side of things, we had to get into the mind of the whale and look at their behavior and work out where and when they were going to do this breaching. The detail you see when you slow this down and you're looking at it at 800 frames per second is amazing. Scientists used aircraft to count as many as 30,000 humpbacks charging down the coast. I was particularly touched by the scene of the adopted narwhal in the beluga pod. I'm just curious how you guys knew that and then following that narwhal's journey. That story came to us through the, the local scientists who were working there who had observed it. There were no other narwhal that we know that were within 600 miles, as you said. So this one narwhal was clearly lost or maybe it was a, a new explorer. We, you don't really know what was going on in its mind. So the beluga choosing to adopt this other species is really something quite extraordinary. And, and it's one of the scenes that I think we can learn a lot <laughs> by watching these whales. And because how do you describe that other than compassion? We struggle sometimes to try and come up with things that are, that are less anthropomorphic. But with whales, it's clear that there is a lot of similarity between us. And this was a great example. If the belugas keep the narwhal in their group, it will be the very first time this type of long-term cross-species adoption has ever been recorded. How do those storylines develop? Do you go in knowing what you're looking for? Or does it change entirely when you get there? We go in with a wish list and then it gets thrown out almost on day one. Uh, and then we come back <laughs> with something entirely different and we start creating afresh. You do know areas where they are. And Brian Scary is a great resource for this and the scientists he works with. But once you get there, the whales didn't get the script. So you're never quite sure what you're going to get. And when we were in Antarctic, for example, we noticed a lot of humpbacks sleeping at the surface. We went in without scuba gear, just very quietly. Ernie Kovacs, great cinematographer. And he, from about 200 yards out, he slowly, slowly, slowly crept up to this sleeping humpback. And so there's this 30-foot giant there just at the surface, you know, sleeping. And he got down the position of its eye and he just waited and waited and waited. And eventually it opened its eye, you know, right in front of our camera. It was tricky because they had these weird kind of 
kind of eyelids. And in the course of doing this, it's like, wait, what if the whale doesn't like being woken up and seeing a strange being right in front of it? I mean, if you imagine you wake up in the morning and I'm staring there looking at you like that with one big eye, you know, uh, how are you going to feel? And what it did when it woke up and we got this great shot is that it wanted to play. It wanted to play for about 45 minutes, just as a toy in the water, like swimming around with Ernie, kind of giving him a high five and just dancing around him. And we got some incredible images like that because, you know, the whales were so generous, allowing us into this space. And that happened time and time again. They are very sentient beings. They are highly evolved. They, they possess cultures that we don't fully understand. Was there a secret that you learned about the whales that surprised you the most? I think the big secret is this is really a, a revelation in science. Previous to now, it's been taboo to say that animals have emotions, that they experience joy, that they play, that they love. I mean, these are controversial things. Darwin said it in Origins of the Species. He mentioned it. And I was like, no, 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 we'll ignore that bit. And we're not going to talk about that. But what's happened is there's been a shift in science. And they're looking at things like an orca mother carrying its dead calf around for days and days, you know, maybe even weeks in some cases. And like, why is it doing that? How do we explain that? And the realization is it has to be mourning. What else can it be? And then we're looking at other, you know, beluga whales that are congregating together in these large groups once a year. And you can see the expression on their faces. They're most expressive, you know, animals out there and they're experiencing joy. So there's this community sense going on and there's this, uh, this culture that is going on that I think is the big secret that we've been keeping from ourselves for, for so long. And I think that's what this series really delves into and really reveals.